Now then. Um, there's a portion this week and kind of ties in with, with what I wanted to share. Um, it's a kev. A kev. The Hebrew word translated means because or as a result of. Um, the portions are, are split into 50, so 52, so you can read one every week. And um, they normally are named from the first phrase in the portion. Um, and the portion this week starts at Deuteronomy 7.12, but it, it's kind of a carry-on from last time I was here. Because um, last time I was here, I was in Deuteronomy 6. And um, the Shema. And this portion starts with, because you are listening to these rulings, keeping and obeying them, and there's blessing in that from the Lord, right? And you'll increase your numbers, blessed in every way. Our God will keep covenant and the love he swore to our fathers because you listen. And mercy is heard. Amen. It says, because you're listening to these rulings, keeping obeying them, I don't know your God will keep with you the covenant and mercy he swore. He will love you, bless you and increase you. You also bless the fruit of your body and the fruit of your ground, your grain, your wine, your olive oil, and the young of your cattle and sheep in the land he swore to give you. Um part of that portion it carries on into Deuteronomy 11 and it says therefore you are to love Adonai your God obey his commission his regulations his rulings his mitzvot commission regulations rulings mitzvot which, which ties to the teaching of the greatest commandment last time and indeed into this week a uh, kev Translated because, but Hebrew has kind of layers to the words. And it can be translated heel, like the heel of your foot. And if you think biblically, you'll, you'll, you, your mind will probably spring to Jacob. Um, why? Because he was known as the heel holder, wasn't he? He grabbed Esau's heel in the womb. He was the one wrestling with the pains of his past and also with God in the flesh, right? Learning to bear his name that he'd be given, Israel. The one who struggles with God, that can also be rendered the prince of God. Just like Israel, though, we, we, we all grapple and wrestle to believe that God's covenant of love and acceptance is for us as well, right? The sages of old interpreted that verse of the portion because you will listen as it shall be when your heel is ready to take a step, you will listen to your heart. Isn't that beautiful? Meaning take that step of faith, begin to walk with God as a child of the great king. They say Abram heard God's words down to his heel. Likewise, we'll hear God's voice as we walk with him by faith. A kev is a doing word. Heal, step. It references action. So we should think of it in regards of us expressing our faith. That the blessing of Adonai swore we will be fulfilled when we take that step. Does that make sense? We say amen. And then there's... For every portion, there's a, there's a portion of the writings and the prophets, the Haftarah. This week comes from Isaiah 49. Beautiful scripture. Can a woman forget a child at the breast? Not show pity on the child from her womb? No woman can do that, right? Even if these were to forget, the Lord says, I won't. I've engraved you 
on the palm of my hand. You know what that means? In 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 times of old, when when the Bedouin tribes would go to war, the mothers would literally sew into the palm of her hand the name of her son, so she'll always look at it and never forget. But it, it hurts when you sew something into you, doesn't it? But that that pain will never go away if she loses him. Adonai does that to every one of us. He's got your name sewn into the palm of his hand. And then, because we're messianic, we go to the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, right? And this time it's Romans 8. It says, fine, that who, who will separate us from the love of Messiah? Trouble, hardship, persecution, hunger, poverty, danger, war. No. In all these things, we're super conquerors through the one who's loved us. And Paul says, I'm convinced neither death nor life, angels or other heavenly rulers, neither what exists nor what is coming, powers above or below, not anything created will be able to separate us from the love of God which comes through the Messiah, Yeshua, our Lord. It, it says, if God is for us, then who can be against us? Who can separate us from the love of Messiah and our faith? That which we've stepped out into. There's no trouble, no hardship, no persecution, no war. Because of what Yeshua did on the cross. Through his infinite mercy, grace and truth. The one who loves us the most. And what are we because of it? Super conquerors. Powerful now. So I couldn't sort of let that pass by. And I had to tie it in. Because last time we looked at Deuteronomy 6, um, 1 to 5, that incorporating the mitzvah, the laws and the rulings. Do we need to lock that door, you think? We'll pull it tight. Mitzvot, commandments. Laws is hokim. Rulings, mishpatim. And if, if, if the faith has a credo, and it does, it would surely be the Shema. So this is the kind of a carry-on from last time. That, that, that said... Um, the religious leadership sent the big gun lawyers in, in um, to test Yeshua. Asking him, testing him, pushing him, wh which is the most important commandment, Yeshua? What did you give him? You give him the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, right? And then he said, there's a second one like it, it's the Vahafta. Love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22. Quite, quite incredible when you think about it. Why? We, we have to understand the king came as first John, uh, as John 1 John 1.14 tells us. He came full of grace and truth. Right? And we as his followers are called to operate in both the same. Yeshua links the old to the new. Right? There's no difference. It's one book. It's one book. The new the new part confirms the old. It don't it, there should be no gap in the middle. Grace and truth. There there are those who live in good, in the grace of God, and there are those who focus just on the truth, right? Either side of that coin can be unbalanced. Both gutter balls, really. Why? All, all truth can be very legalistic. It can be nasty and destructive. 
Why? Because not one of us can walk in all truth. Not one. There's people who come into this movement and oh, we're a Torah observant congregation. No, you're not. You can't be. You're trying, but you're not. You're not Torah observant to, to observe it all. Really, only Yeshua could do that, right? You cannot judge people on the basis of all truth. That makes you subject to the same. Otherwise, you're going to you're going to be an hypocrite, right? Being a hypocrite isn't good. It's not a good thing. You, you cannot judge people through the eyes of the law and then expect to be judged through the eyes of grace, can you? Hypocrite. So the Lord says, to the extent you judge, you will be judged. Not extending mercy will result in mercy not being extended to you. Biblical principle, foundational kingdom principle, right? And that goes across all denom denominational lines. If you live all by grace, that can be equally as dangerous. Because then, then you can fall into licentiousness. Thinking, well, it's, all, it's okay, it's all under the blood, right? It's all forgivable. I'm good. Dangerous. Dangerous. The children of Israel went through a period of 150 years at one point without being judged. The prophets warning them. Warning and warning, 150 years and then judgment came. Because they were mistakenly thinking, there's been no judgment, we're okay, we're good. Right? We're being blessed. We've got a very, very merciful God, very patient God. But th there is a point through which we must not go. Because he will say no more. All grace, deceptive. Greasy, slippery. You will fall. All truth, destructive, damaging. I know people, I've seen it, I've seen it here in Perth. You've got to stay centered on grace and truth because that's where you find Yeshua. This is a Yeshua centered, spirit filled congregation. He's our foundation. Grace and truth. Centered on both, full of grace and truth. Is that fair? Adonai, your God, ordered me to teach you to obey in the land you're crossing over to possess so that you'll fear Adonai, your God. Observe his regulations, his mitzvot, his commandments that I'm giving you. You, your child, your grandchild. Hebrew idiomatic, meaning forever. As long as you live. So that you'll have a long life. Therefore listen Israel. And take care to obey. So that things will go well for you. You'll increase greatly. Same deal right? As I don't know the God of your ancestors promised. Giving you a land of milk and honey. Abundant life. He's saying. To Moses. This isn't a suggestion. I want you to teach my people. It, it, it isn't a democracy, Moses. You hear that word all the time in, in, in the mainstream media. Democracy, 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 right? Especially the American um, media. The, the problem is, over 250 years, America's never been a democracy. It's not even in the Constitution. It's not in the Bill of Rights. It's not in anything. Because that's, that's the way the founders made it for them. The shamozzle we've got here, that's democracy. And it's a shamozzle. It's, it's basically mob rule, isn't it? 51%. Well, that, that's how it should roll. You only need 30 now and you get majority of government here. I'm still trying to figure that one out. Shambolic electoral system but you know I'm digressing my point is the church isn't a democracy it's a theocracy we do what God says he ordered Moses to teach Adonai told Jeremiah if, if you don't tell the people what I tell you to tell them I'm going to do you son 
I'm going to break you down. Consequences if he didn't. But the Lord also reassured Jeremiah of his protection and support despite the opposition he would encounter. It's not always easy telling people what God wants told. But you don't want to be broken down neither, do you? They're going into the land now. They're crossing over. And they were to fear Adonai. Fear. Not, oh, shaking in your boots, fear. Reverence. Respect. And that's right, isn't it? We demand respect from our children. We expect our kids to do what we tell them, don't we? God's no, God's no different. Know who you come before. He is the Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai, the creator and sustainer of the universe, right? He wants and commands respect. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. He wants you to fear him, respect him, observe all his regulations, his mitzvah, his commandments. You, your child, your grandchildren, trickle down spirituality. Because if you don't, and they don't, who will? Who's teaching the word of God now? Because you end up with what we've got now. When you don't, when you take God out of the picture, you end up with a society like we've got now. It's not nice, is it? Is it? It's our responsibilities. The government won't teach them. The schools certainly won't. Christian or not. They will not. It's our responsibility to teach our kids. And it brings blessing. It brings long life. Listen, Israel. Take care to obey. Then things will go well. You'll increase greatly. I don't know. I promised milk and honey. Abundance. And then you see the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear Israel. Adonai, he is our God and he is one. And you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul and strength. The greatest commandment. So mitzvot, laws and rulings. Three separate entities, different things. Mitzvot, commandments, laws, hochim, rulings, mishpatim. So commandments, legislation and judicial issues. Does that make sense? I've not split anybody's head up yet. Nobody's thrown anything at me yet, so I must be doing okay. Shema Yisrael, love the Lord. That, that, that's the commandment. Don't commit adultery or steal. That's hochim. That, that's a law. They're laws. Mishpatim would be to say, well, if you've stole something, you must give it back plus 20% recompense. That's mishpatim. All of which is encompassed in, in what we know as Torah. Civil, legislative, and judicial. All Torah. We need law, don't we? Pe people hear law and go, Ooh, get a spiritual tilt, but we need it. If we don't have it, what do we get? Anarchy. Torah, law. It's direction, instruction. Some say it's the first five books of the Bible. Some say it's the Old Testament. Some say the whole word of God. What it encompasses is God's ways. That's Torah. It's law, direction, and instruction. Now there's a root word to every Hebrew word. That's Yorah. It's a verb. This is to direct, instruct, and to teach. To show us which way to go. Yorah. Now, thank God because of Yeshua, we, we have an eternal, internal, Navigation system, don't we? Holy Spirit, because of Yeshua's sacrifice, who leads us if we defer. 
like, like a GPS. You, you, you're driving along and your GPS says, oh, turn right at the next lights. You don't have to. It's not going to force your arm up your back to turn, at, turn right at the next lights, is it? You have to yield to get the direction. That's Holy Spirit. We have to defer. We have to ask him to direct us. He cannot and will not make us yield. Neither can the enemy. Don't, don't give him that much credit. He's powerful, yeah. He's not as powerful as God. And he certainly can't force you to do anything. All he can do is tempt you. What do we say? Father God, lead us not into temptation. Not into temptation because he's going to set some traps for you along the way. And the Lord will go, don't stand there. Don't do that. Honey? And he leads us not into temptation. We all see through the glass dimly though, don't we? But it's to direct, to teach, to instruct, yara. The connotation in the Hebrew is for an archer to shoot an arrow and hit a bullseye. That's Yara. Now, just so we're clear, you, you, you don't get to use the Bible as though it's like a running buffet and you've got sandwiches, quiche, volivants, chicken legs, sandwiches, quiche, volivants, chicken legs, and you go, oh, I'll have a bit of that. I like some chicken leg, but I'm going to stay away from the quiche. Isn't it? You can't do that with the Bible. Oh, I like that part there, but that bit, woof, staying away from. You can't do that. It's not cafeteria Christianity. Your R is whoosh, shooting an arrow and hitting the target, bullseye. If, if you do your cafeteria Christianity thing, it, it, it's something akin to running up to the wall, drilling a hole in it, sticking your arrow in it, and then painting a target around it and going, bullseye! Another problem you can have is, is if you've been marinated by your denominational lines, or by Granny, or by Pastor Dave, or whoever, and you've developed a certain theology. Now, when, when you read the Bible, you, you're going to read it then in that denominational slant. And you're going to highlight things in the Bible that agree with that slant to force your theology through. It defends your theology. But to do that, you're more than likely going to have to take Scripture out of context, and that's a dangerous thing to do. Rather than reading context first for the correct interpretation, because there is one that the Lord wants to, to give you. Uh, and if you do that, then you hit the mark. His Torah is his teaching. Teaching's a better translation. Teaching. More than law. Yeshua came to teach. A sheep without a shepherd. The shepherd watches over his sheep. He teaches them. They love him. He loves them. They follow him. That the, 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 the shepherds in Israel don't drive sheep. They go in front of him and the, and the sheep follow. They know him. They know his voice. He gives instructions, guidance, and navigates the path. If we do the things he wants us to do, life's going to be good. It'll go well. Your, it'll go well. Your tab. Life will be good, right and beautiful. Your tab. It will not be good without the Lord. He blesses us. He loves to bless us. The Bible starts in blessing. His blessings all the way through. It finishes with blessing because he likes to bless. He wants to bless our lives. He wants our lives to be good. Now, 
I'm just going to go off on a little tangent for you again. Um, who, who knows what systematic theology is? Beth sticking her hand up because she's going through to the bonus round. <laughs> it's a system of studying God, is all. And, and, and it aims to present an orderly, rational, coherent account of doctrine. The doctrines of our faith by subject matter. So if we apply this principle to Judaism and Christianity, it it's going to give you something of a revelation about Torah. Look at Judaism. It's basically made up of three main subjects, which is God, the people of God, one of the main tenets is love God more than yourself, love people as yourself. That's coming out of Judaism, right? Main principle. And, th and then, obviously, Torah, the teachings of God. That's the, your three main tenets in Judaism, fair? If we then look at Christianity, we have God, the people of God, and Yeshua Jesus, Right? So side by side, you're going to see a difference. And there it is. Both devote to God and the people of God, and it's right and that's good and that's no problem, but in Christianity, where's the Torah? Judaism, where's Yeshua? What, what if I said to you that they're one and the same thing? What if I said to you, Judy, Judaism missed him and Christianity missed it? Now, Judaism and the Torah. There are systematic theologians who have written very nice interpretive Bibles, highly, highly regarded. You have Rabbi Isidore Epstein. He was a prominent Orthodox rabbi and scholar he wrote a notable work, The Faith of Judaism, An Interpretation of Our Time. It was 386 pages, 57 of which were devoted to Torah. 15%, so no small affair. Solomon Schechter, he wrote The Aspects of Rabbinic Theology, 343 pages, 69 of which are Torah-driven. 20%. Cool, no problem. What about Lewis Jacobs, a Jewish theology, 331 pages, 73 of which he devoted to Torah, a total of 22%. So somewhere around a fifth, about a fifth devoted to Torah. That's what you're seeing in Jewish systematic theology and teaching. Fair? What about Christianity? We have one, Augustus Strong. Augustus Strong, Systematic Theology, 1,056 pages. And he gives us a total of 28 pages on the law, 2%. Louis Burkhoff, 745 pages and just three of them, 0.5%. Half of 1%. And then we have one Lewis Berry Schaefer. His seventh volume. A whopping 2,607 pages long. How many volumes did he do? You'd still be reading that till Yeshua came back. He's a, a cohort of C.I. Schofield, a founder member of the Dallas Cemetery, I mean seminary. And, and was indeed their first president. And its title, get this, is Systematic Theology Within Judaism. Like, like a Christian perspective. And, it, and he wrote a whole seven pages on it. 0.25%, a quarter of 1%. So... There you see it. Now, you've got to look at that and think, well, 
taught it in Christendom, in the realms of Christendom, is given very little to no regard then, right? That's fair. Or it's oversimplified or mostly completely ignored. Why? Why? I'll, I'll tell you why. Because the, the seminaries churn pastors out and they teach them, well, that's Jewish stuff. That's nothing to do with us. Oh, Jesus nailed it to the cross. How many times have you heard that? There's a reality you can't dance around. If, if you read Jewish literacy and you read what Orthodox Jews have to say about Jesus, they, they'll always say, no, no, G Jesus was an observant Jew. Probably the most observant Jew, right? Pincus Lapid said that. They're like a rabbi up in the echelons. Tour observant. And, and they quite legitimately then show you scriptures out of the New Testament. Like Matthew 5. Don't think I've come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I've not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Yes, indeed, I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yod or a stroke will pass from the Torah. Not until everything that must happen has happened. So whoever disobeys the least of these mitzvot and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys and teaches will be called great, right? They'll, they'll throw that at you and go, well, see, he's observant. He, it was his one and only sermon. He, he had a lot of teachings. He had a lot of parables to, to tell. But he only really ever gave one sermon. It's Matthew 5 to 7. It's the kingdom manifesto. The Sermon on the Mount. They, they don't recognize him as Messiah, but they certainly um, recognize him observant to Judaism because he was. I'm telling you he is, and I'm telling you he will be. Why? Because he's the king of the Who's. He's, he's the king of Israel. The word will go out from Zion. I didn't come to abolish the commandments, the law and the rulings of God. Why, why would he? He says, I've come to fulfill them. So you don't understand quite what he's saying there, that it's idiomatic, it's, it's, it's first century rabbinic augmentation, it's Hebrew idiom. So you, you take Pastor Dave's seminary understanding of it and, and think, well, well, he fulfilled it, so we don't have to. And you run with that for 30 years. Right? Play, play rato. Play rato. Fulfill. Do you, you want to know the meaning? I've got it here. You look this up. Play rato is to cause God's will, as made known in the Torah, to be obeyed as it should be. And God's promises given through the prophets to receive fulfillment. What does that mean? That means they're saying, Yeshua's going to do this. Messiah's going to do that. That are 333 of them. Prophetic scriptures. He has to fulfill as Messiah. To be the Messiah. It don't, you can't dance past that. And he does. Because he's the Messiah. Right? Well, he, he fulfilled it so we don't have to. And really? But there's always that little spiritual tilt in the back of your mind, isn't there? When some nutbag like me comes along and says, hey, hang on a minute, what happens when you commit adultery? Are we not under that law anymore? If you stay, if you go rob a bank, well, that, that, that counts as stealing still, doesn't it? You, you can't plead ignorance there. Because there's no mitigation for ignorance. You you can't run, like I've said before, you can't run 100 mile an hour through a school zone and when the police pull you up, go, I didn't know. That 
he's not going to have a bar of it, is he? He's just going to bust you. And then he, if you if you bolshe and you go, well, I, I'm not under that law. <laughs> See how that one lands for you. He's come to properly teach to fill you to the full. Make biblical Judaism, the scriptures, the thing he wrote, the thing that he is. He is the word. Mamre, Logos, the Word of God. The thing God used to create everything. He blew everything into existence with. That's Yeshua. With God and was God and is God, right? He is the Torah. He wrote it. Fill you to the full. Make Judaism whole. It was it was it was like it was like having three quarters of an apple pie. It wasn't complete. He came to complete and make it whole, make it something workable. It didn't work properly before. It couldn't until he came. But now it's alive and it's kicking. You have to look at the Torah through the prism of Messiah, Messianic Judaism. That's the faith. And it works. The problem was, back then, as now, what they were trying to do was hold on to God with one hand and hold on to the faith with the other and go, hang on a minute, how much can I have of both and still get in? One way or another, you're going to let one of them go or the other. Because you can't hold on to both. It's going to split you down the middle. He's saying, hold on to me with everything you have. And he slammed them. He didn't make it any easier, did he? If you look at a woman with loss, you just committed adultery. That, that's not making it easier, is it? It means we're all in the same boat. None of us are holy. Not one. You, you can hold your hands up like this all you want. That don't make you holy. You're only holy because of what you're wearing. You're wearing his garment. His garment. Wear it well. What you can't say is, oh well, he, he fulfilled it so we don't have to. Heaven forbid. We have a faith that without works is dead. We have a faith that works. It has to work. Why? Because we're saved. Not to be saved. Because we're saved. Saved by grace. Nobody can boast that they work their way in. Nobody. You cannot. We're made holy though by his word. There's a process. It's called sanctification. Sanctified by his truth. His word his teaching, his laws, his rulings, his Torah, his truth. And we're supposed to follow it and obey it. Period. Period. Now, is that is that Arnie being partisan messianic? No, it's not. Th this is you know, let me one second. Christian as Christian can be, right? New American standard, fair? Kenny Baker, Donald Burdick, John Steck, Walter Wessel, Ronald Youngblood, Kenneth Bower, William M. Crudenier. They, they, these boys are no numpsies. These boys are scholars, Christian scholars, right? Working for Zondervan. They're, they're, it's the study notes that they put together there's a passage in, in Romans 8 therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death the requirement of the law this is how they break this down listen to this the law still plays a role in the life of a believer 
Not, however, as a means of salvation, but as a moral and ethical guide. Obeyed out of love for God and by the power that the Spirit provides. This is the fulfillment of Jeremiah 31, 33 to 34, a prophecy of the new covenant, that of which we're all under. Fulfilled. God's aim in sending his son was that believers might be enabled to embody the true and full intentions of the law. According to the spirit, how the law's righteous requirements can be fully met by no longer letting the sinful nature hold sway, but by yielding to the directing and empowering ministry of Holy Spirit. Christianity 101. Where, where are you getting all this? It's nailed to the cross from. These boys, these boys are New American Standard. These boys are New International Version. Nearly inflammable. Zondervan. How, how come they get it? How come they get it? It's only what I'm teaching. I don't teach anything different to that. Never have, never will. How come they get it? <laughs> Jew Jewish literacy will tell you Jesus is an observant Jew. What well, they then go on and say, well, well, it was all Paul's fault. He, he wrote them letters and he taught against the Torah. It's his fault. He's, he's a false teacher. There are those who attach themselves to Messianic Judaism. And they attach themselves to Messianic Judaism like the Hebrew Roots mob. It's, 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 it's as different. Hebrew Roots and Messianic Judaism, just so as you know, it's like saying, I'm an evangel evangelical Christian and you're a Mormon. That's how different it is. It's got nothing to do with us. Nothing. The complete, it's a completely different faith altogether, right? No hold bad. Got no apologies for that. None. They attach themselves and, and, and they'll tell you the same. I've heard it out of their own mouth. Oh, yeah, Paul's a false teacher. Really? You sure? Peter wrote in his second letter, Indeed, speaking about Paul, he speaks of these things in all his letters. They, they contain some things that are hard to understand. Things that the uninstructed and the unstable distort to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. Now, you, you can slice it and dice it any which way you want, but Peter was no slouch. You can, yeah, he was a fisherman, but he knew the scriptures. You don't think Yeshua just pulled him out of thin air, do you? He, he, he knew he was picking. He picked those boys for a reason. And they knew the scriptures. He knew the word, and he lived with Yeshua for three and a half years, and he knew Paul well. And he knew how brilliant he was. And he knows, how, how, he knows, he, he knows Paul's difficult to understand. Because he's that brilliant. Well, so if, if, he, if he can struggle with that, where do we get off the bus? Some things are difficult to understand. Yes, they are. Even if you study. The, the, the NLT puts it, this is it, those who are ignorant and unstable, they twist these letters. That's the NLT. Ignorant, not stupid, ignorant. I mean, the one who ignores the truth, you, you, you can't ignore when the police pull you over for speeding, like, like I said, officer didn't know. You can't be that ignorant. You've got no excuse. There, there, there's no mitigation for being ignorant. Likewise, you, you can't hold to something you've been taught and say, well, Arnie, I don't want to hear it. It's not what I got taught. I, I don't want to hear it. Leave me alone. Well, you can, but... They, they twist what Paul taught. Avon. Twist. Avon. It, it's iniquity. It's guilt. 
But the root of it is, is to convey the idea of being twisted and perverted. Iniquity twists us, it perverts us. And we need to be straight and true, don't we? Thank you, Ed. Before we set the place on fire. <laughs> We need to know the truth to know the lie, don't we? Yeah, blow it out, mate. It's going to just... <laughs> we have to be straight and true, and we need to know the truth to know the lie. Is that fair? So they just twist Paul up, and, I, and it's, it's not just bad interpretation it means something completely wrong just wrong and they don't just do it to Paul's writings they, they do it to the other scriptures too they, they teach to their own destruction and unfortunately that gets taught to the poor unfortunate souls who, who are sitting under that teaching right there's good reason you get double judged for, for teaching you should I'd, I'm I'm perfectly fine with that. I don't. I've got no problem, no problem with that. But listen to this. There's a guy called Charles Cranfield. He's an English theologian. Durham University he was known for his approach to the biblical text and and being deeply respectful to its understanding, the original meaning and context. Charles Cranfield. This, this man is a scholar's scholar, one of, one of the best by all accounts, highly, highly regarded and renowned. He, he wrote this for the Scottish Journal of Theology in 1964 concerning Paul and the law. You, you need to grasp hold of this, people. So again, you, nobody can argue your line is being partisan. Listen, listen to this. The, the Greek language of Paul's day possessed no word or no word group corresponding to our legalism, legalist or legalistic. This means he had lacked a convenient use of terminology for expressing a vital distinction and so was surely seriously hampered in the work of clarifying the Christian position with regard to the law or the Torah. In view of this, we should always think be, and be ready to reckon with the possibility that Pauline's statements, which at first seemed to disparage the law, were really directed not against the law itself, but against the misunderstanding and misuse of it. For which we now have a, con a convenient terminology in this very difficult terrain Paul was pioneering. Charles Cranfield St. Paul and the Law in the Ju Scottish Journal of Theology, 1964. Le legalistic perversion. A legalist, listen, is someone who thinks themselves better than someone else because they observe the law. That's a legalist. Not someone who obeys the law. You see the difference? And then there's those who have secret revelation. I've met a few of them here as well. Like they're, like they're the only ones who have that information. Like they think they're better than others. It's abuse of the Torah. I, 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 need, I need to be clear, we, we are totally saved by grace. No man can boast. We, we cannot be justified by the law. Cannot. Nobody can. Doesn't matter how much you pray, doesn't matter what you wear, doesn't matter how much you give to charity, none of it. You're saved by grace, by faith. But we are made holy by the Word of God. Sanctification. We're supposed to be living a holy life. Is that is that fair dues? We're supposed to be priests of the kingdom. Priests and, pri and priestesses, a holy, a holy nation, a kingdom of a kingdom of priests. Mamlechikohenim. That's not Exodus 19. That's Peter. 
Shimon Kiefer. We are now being born again, as, and it's written on the tablet of your heart. That's Jeremiah 31. That's the new covenant. The re renewed covenant. It's a renewed covenant. Kodesh is, is renewed like you get a new moon. It's not, it's not a new moon per se, is it? It's the same old moon, renewed. It's a renewed covenant. Love, the fruit of the Spirit, does freely what God's Torah requires. That's the goal of kingdom Torah. The royal law. Legalistic perversion. That it was rife. That they were saying back then, these Gentiles have to follow the law to be saved. You've got to be circumcised to be saved. You've got to follow the law to be saved. That's Judaizing. That's not what this is. Not at all. You've got to be circumcised in the heart. It's a new heart with a new spirit, God's spirit. Ezekiel says he's going to cause you to walk out his ways, his laws, his Torah. Ezekiel 36, 24, 27. That's the new covenant. He wants us to follow the law because we are saved. It's a completely different concept. Huge, huge cosmic poles apart difference. Paul had no words in the Koine Greek for legalism or legalistic. Wasn't a word then. Look at Galatians. Knowing that a man, King Jimmy, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we may be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no, no flesh shall be justified. Fair dues. I've got no problem with that. But you can read that and twist it, can't you? And people have and do. It's Paul, and he's right what he's saying. And, and, and whenever he's teaching in regards of the law, he's saying you cannot be saved by it. Cannot. You can't be justified by the law, no problem. He doesn't say, though, let's flush it down the toilet, does he? You're not going to find that in the scripture. Yeah, let's forget about it. Don't worry about it no more. Nailed to the cross. You're not going to find that. There's no scripture for that. You're not going to find it because it's not there. He was a Torah observant Jew. All over Acts. Do, do, do you read Acts? Do you read it? This gets people confused because he, he, he looks like he's, he's getting blown around and, and saying... To Jews, he's obeying it, and Gentiles have nothing to do with it, and da-da-da-da-da. And, and that, that's just perception. That's somebody's commentary. It's not the scripture, and it's not in context. You, you, you can make him look like a hypocrite, or, that, or at least that's what gets taught. I'm here to tell you he's absolutely not confused. He's not hypocritical. He's certainly not being blown around. May, maybe we are because we misread the scriptures and we distort them to our own destruction. This, this is the Christian poster boy. Acts 23, knowing that one part of the Sanhedrin consisted of Sadducees and the other Pharisees, Paul shouts, brothers, I myself am a Pharisee, am. What's that? present tense this is 20 years in 20 years into his faith he's on trial for his life now hey, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a Pharisee hey, how did that happen I thought he got converted on Damascus Road maybe he got completed as a Jew rather than converted to a Christian maybe um, Acts 24 but this I do admit to you, I worship the God of our fathers, 
in accordance with the way, which they call a sect, which it, which it was and is, it's still a sect of Judaism. I continue to believe everything that accords with the Torah. What? How does that work? Acts 25. He arrived. The Judeans had come down from Jerusalem, stood around him, bringing many serious charges against him, which they couldn't prove, by the way. And in reply, Shaul said, I've committed no offense. Not against the Torah, not against the Jews, not against the temple, not against the emperor. Is he lying? Is he being blown around? Is he a hypocrite? Or is he telling the truth? Acts 28. Now he's been living in Rome for two years. He calls the, the, the brethren in, the Jewish boys, and he says, I've done nothing against either our people or the traditions of our fathers, and they believed him. That's your Christian poster boy who never touched the Torah. Justified. To be rendered righteous. No problem. All over Romans, Galatians, and Corinthians, he goes to great pains to tell you that the Torah cannot save you. It was never meant to save you. It's the Lord who saves. The law, though, is meant for a redeemed people. What did he do? Go back to Exodus. He brought the people out of bondage, slavery to the world, darkness, Mitzrayim, Egypt, the world, right? With a strong arm and a mighty hand. He pulled them out, he saved them. Saved and redeemed them, didn't he? Through the what? The Passover lamb. He had to paint the blood round the doorposts and lintel. And they have to go through the door. Who's the door? They stay at the door, the angel of death's going to nail them. They can't stay at the door, they've got to go through the door. Who's the door? Right. So if you've got his blood painting around the doorpost and lintel of your heart, the angel of death has to pass over you too. But now, what are we doing? Now we believe, now we're in the kingdom, now we're babies. Now we've got to grow. Now we've got to walk through the wilderness of life, don't we? How are we going to do that? He gives us a way to live. 50 days later, Shavuot, Pent Pentecost, he gave him a law. This is how I want you to live. And I'm going to live with you. And you're going to live abundantly. And you're going to be blessed. The commandments were given to a redeemed people. Exodus 12 was the Passover. He gave them the law in Exodus 20. So likewise, when we come into the kingdom and we're babies, we have to learn to grow. We're saved, but we've got to grow. How are we supposed to behave? Now we get to call the creator and the sustainer of the universe, Abba, Daddy, Daddy, he's our Daddy. And he expects good behavior from his kids because he's a good parent. We should do what Daddy says, right? So there's a process, justification, sanctification, glorification. Spiritual principles. Here's the thing though, here's the problem. Because of bad teaching, pe people think that you can get justified and just park up. Sit back on a lazy boy and wait for the eastern sky to crack open and Yeshua zap them out of the way on a magic carpet ride before anything bad happens. That's the problem, isn't it? You sit in heaven for seven years, you let the Jewish people take another massive kick in while we're all having a party in heaven and then we come back dancing with Jesus. That, that's, what, that's what they expect you to believe. That's not scripture, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And it doesn't matter if you like people like Amir Safari or whoever who put a John Hagee. They're wrong. They're just wrong. I'm here to tell you, you cannot jump from justification to glorification. There is a process of holiness in the middle that we all have to go through. 
And the only way you get a magic carpet ride is to prefer to pervert and twist the scripture. We're supposed to be about looking more like Yeshua. That's the goal. Look more and more like him. It's more than being saved. That's beautiful. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Never, ever forget it. But you've got to grow up and you've got to move on. And you've got to work for the kingdom. You've got to grow to be more like him. He's our example. Is it easy? No. You never said it was easy. You never said that. He said it's going to cost you everything. And it hurts. But he's the one who drives you. And he's the one who's got to drill out. Like a dentist drills out a bad tooth. The Lord has to drill you out and put him in. He has to increase. We have to decrease, don't we? That's the whole game. Your soul cry is that he should increase. That should be your soul cry once you're saved, whether you know it or not. We're supposed to occupy till he comes. Be his representation. You, you, you can't just do that and just be you. You can't. You need him if you're going to be an ambassador for him. Works of the law. Ergon nomos. Legalistic observance. Ergon nomos. That's the better translation. Legalistic observance. That was what Paul was trying to convey. You got Yeshua's brother James. Yeah, I he won't call James. He knew Yeshua well, didn't he? He said, faith without works is what? He said, show me your faith without your actions and I'll show you my faith by him. Keep warm. Eat well. Have shalom. But then you don't give what you need to. Keep warm and eat well and have shalom. Just leave them to it. What good is that? It shouldn't be rendered works of law. It's a bad rendering. Therefore, Galatians should have read. Even so, we've come to realize that a person is not declared righteous by God on the ground of his legalistic observing of Torah commands. That makes more sense, doesn't it? But through the Messiah, Yeshua's trust in faithfulness. Therefore, we too have put our trust in Messiah sure and become faithful to him in order that we may be declared righteous on the ground of Messiah's trust in faithfulness, not on the ground of legalistic observance of Torah commands. For on the ground of legalistic observance of Torah commands, no one will be declared righteous. King Jimmy, Romans 6.14 for sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye, us, are not under us, the law us. But under grace, us. Not under law, but under grace. So we have ergon nomos, works of the law, and we have upo nomos, under the law. Perversion by legalism. Was that bad Greek? I'm sorry, calf. It's Greek with a Mancunian accent. You're never going to figure it out. I'm str I struggle with English at the best of times. Under the law. That's where the confusion kicks in. I don't want to be under the law. Annie, you're putting me under the law. But if you're a blood-bought, card-carrying believer in Yeshua Jesus, his laws, his ways, his Torah... Now it's written in you, in you. Not on, not on a tablet of stone, it's a tablet of a heart now. And that Torah then gets infused by the same Holy Spirit that resurrected the king. The same spirit 
that breathed the whole of, it, of, of the universe into existence. To enable you, cause you to walk out what your heavenly Father wants you to do. All you've got to do is shema. Listen with the intention to obey. And he will talk to you. And you stay close. You stay penitent and you stay close. And you go back for a washing every day. Penitent every day. One bath, many washings, right? Yeshua is the word of God made flesh. He is the Torah made flesh. The Torah had to bleed for us. He walked it out perfectly. Not so we don't have to. So that we'd have an example to follow. He wrote it and he is it. Uponomos, perversion by legalism. It's not under the law, it's perversion of legalism of the perfect Torah. It's perversion of the perfect Torah. It's the royal law, holy, just and good, Paul calls it. Romans 7.12 7, There's nothing wrong with the word of God. There's everything wrong with us, isn't there? We're unholy. We're unjust. We're not, we're not good. You didn't nail the Torah to the cross. You nailed our sin. That's what it says. CJB, Romans 6.14, should say, for sin will not have the authority over you because we are not under legalism but under grace. Makes more sense. Right? How are we doing? We're nearly there. Are we all good? Not getting fidgety yet? We're not legalistic. We're under grace and a power. It's a power. It's the grace of salvation. There's, the, there's a power. That power is the Holy Spirit and you see it all over the scriptures. The, the Holy Spirit. It's not there. I'm sorry to say, help me speak gibberish. I'm not really sorry for that. It's not there so you can perform triple salcos and somersaults and bark like a dog and, and, and laugh uncontrollably. It's not there for that. That's a completely different... That's the spirit, all right? It's not the holy one. He's there to give you a power to walk out God's truth. Period. His word is truth. We don't want a form of religion that has no power. There's grace for salvation, but his grace doesn't stop there. He has grace onto sanctification and he's got grace onto glorification. It's all grace. Ergo nomos, uponomos. 20 times you see it throughout Romans, Galatians and Corinthians. You see it. And for 2,000 years, unstable and untrained people have perverted it and distorted it. Ergo nomos, uponomos, in Paul's thinking was negative in connotation. Under the law, works of law, both meaning legalistic perversion. Christianity, though, views those phrases in the framework of observing the Torah. And it's wrong. Romans 15, 6, 15. What then? Shall we sin? Because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Let's go on sinning. Because we're not under legalism, but under grace. Heaven forbid. God forbids it. Because the only thing God nailed to the cross was your sin. And the only thing his law's got nailed to was your heart. Shall we sin more? Let's be lawless. So grace can abound more. That, that was like Gnostic thinking. Nicolaitan thinking. 
It's not you. It's not you who's sinning. It's just your flesh. Gnostic. Let's sin more so grace can abound more. No, let's not. Should we be lawless or should we be lawful? Yeah, and you've got the, the dictionary biblical definition. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Violation of Torah. As the complete Jewish puts it, sin is violation of Torah. It, lawlessness in the Greek is anomia. Anomia. It's the condition of being without law because of ignorance or violation. It's where we get our word anemia from. Anemia can kill you, right? When your blood isn't carrying the oxygen it needs to your tissues. What happens in the natural happens in the spiritual. Likewise in the spiritual, if, if you have spiritual anemia, guess what? The condition of being without law because of ignorance or violation, ignorance certainly isn't bliss and it's certainly no excuse. Well, well, our pastor never taught us, Arnie. Well, we've all got the same Bible. Anomia. It means iniquity and wickedness. Now, you, you, might, you might go to Sunday church and you might think, well, I've got to tell my pastor about this. He's got to, at some point, consider you a trouble causer and get down to Wangara and go and see Nutbag Arnie. He'd probably fit him better down there. They'll, they'll look at you as a trouble causer, I'm telling you. So, uh, at least you're good here, no problem. The bottom line is we have to be born again, Right? We've come to faith in our Heavenly Father through His Son Yeshua, born again anew. But now we've got to grow in the kingdom. As believers, we, we, we follow our great shepherd in His ways. It's a process. It's a lifelong process. Sanctification. None of us have it all together. Nobody's arrived. Ten years in, Paul all he went through, the beatings, the, the, the stonings, the whippings, the robbing, he got robbed, he got left for dead, he, everything he went through. Ten years into his faith, he said, I, I, I've not arrived yet. I'm not there yet. Paul, how dare we say we are? But he said, I press on. I press on to win the prize. You know, you, when you don't have to feel bad if you've not arrived, you're in good company then, right? Because you won't until either you go or you sure comes. But we press on. We endure. The Mosaic Covenant is a covenant still in play. There's five covenants. Five. The Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Davidic, the Israeli, and the new. He has to be in play because he's not he's a covenant keeping God. He don't he doesn't push him down the toilet. The law's still good. It's us that aren't. It's not faulty, it's fault finding. It's the perfect law of God. And it's holy, right, and just. But it's like looking in a mirror. And and I'm sure you girls know. When, when you're putting your makeup on and you've got one of them mirrors with the bright lights around it and you can see all your little blemishes that you cover over with your polyfiller and your, and your Botox and whatever else you use. But it shows up your little blemishes. The Torah shows us our faults. 
And our faults are many. And it, and it really should make you drop to your knees and say, Daddy, I'm so sorry. Please don't let me go more than three feet from the cross. Wash me clean, Lord, and forgive me for what I am. Help me just a little bit to look more like Yeshua. But still, for all the good we can do, we're still capable of being very selfish, arrogant, prideful, gossipy, whatever it might be. Because we're just broken, cracked pots, aren't we? There's no better place to be, though, than at the foot of the cross. Your shoe will wash you clean there, amen? So we serve a great God who loves us, and we're incredibly lucky beggars. And I want to encourage you to be like Paul, be a one thing kind of a believer. He says, one thing, you know, I, I'm going to forget what's behind us. And I'm going to press on. I'm going to keep straining forward, pressing on toward the goal to win the prize. That That's offered by God's upward calling to us. It's a high calling. We have in Messiah Yeshua. So let's be who he's called us to be. Let's be that first century church, eh? His hands and feet shining our light. Going after and seeking and saving the lost. That, that's why we're here. Standing in the breach for the sake of righteousness. I want us to be a first century Beth Yeshua that he's called us to be. Amen. Shabbat shalom, beautiful people.